four o'clock in the morning on June 3rd, two men arose in Florida. They began preparing for their day's work as they had since June a year ago. Jim McDivitt, command pilot of Gemini 4. Ed White, pilot in the right seat. For the next few hours, they would systematically progress toward launch. The steps were now a normal routine. They had done them again and again. They had practiced flying Gemini 4 in a simulator. They had practiced emergency aborts. They had their temperature and blood pressure taken. One day in St. Louis, as part of the thousand and one things the crew did, McDivitt disassembled the locking mechanism of the spacecraft hatch. Later today, that would become important. But it was now June 3rd. A year had ended for these men. A year devoted to a single goal, flying a four-day mission in Gemini 4. America's first long-duration mission, Gemini 4, would complete 62 revolutions. The flight plan called for the spacecraft to be inserted into orbit at 32.5 degrees north latitude at 185 statute miles in altitude over Bermuda. People were already adding a new word to their vocabularies, EVA. It stood for extravehicular activity. Some were uncertain whether you said EVA or EVA, but regardless of the pronunciation, it would become an abbreviation of our time. The flight plan called for EVA to begin on the second orbit. Somewhere over Hawaii, the pilot was to open the hatch of a depressurized cabin and stand up. Over the west coast of the United States, he would leave the spacecraft and expose himself to space. For 12 minutes, he would perform maneuvers over the United States. He would return to Gemini 4 and continue the mission as the spacecraft neared the night side of the Earth over the Atlantic. This was the flight plan. A special EVA suit and life support pack had been designed and tested by NASA engineers in the Crew Systems Division. The EVA helmet has three visors. The inner visor is the normal suit visor which seals in suit pressure. Over it are two special visors. They are detachable and need not be worn throughout the entire mission. The outer or sun visor is easily recognized from its gold coating. It reflects both visible light and infrared rays. With it attached, only 10% of the sun's visible light is admitted. Beneath the sun visor, but not visible here, is an inner protective visor made of polycarbonate plastic. The Gemini suit has layers of aluminized mylar, nylon, and felt. In combination, they protect the astronaut against temperature and space particles. Special overgloves are worn to guard against extremes of space temperature if the astronaut should grasp the spacecraft during EVA. As the astronaut leaves Gemini, he is attached by a supporting umbilical line, 25 feet long. The umbilical is actually one assembly consisting of three elements, a nylon tension line, electrical wiring, and an umbilical line. The nylon line, or tether, is shorter than the umbilical line. It takes all loads exerted during EVA and can withstand 1,000 pounds of pull. The electrical wiring enables the astronaut to maintain direct communication with his command pilot. It also records biomedical readings for ground surgeons. The umbilical line furnishes oxygen to the suit from the spacecraft's primary oxygen system. The life support pack, mounted on the parachute harness, contains an emergency oxygen bottle. If the umbilical line should fail, the astronaut would have enough oxygen to support him for at least nine minutes, more than enough time for him to return to the spacecraft safely in an emergency. The pilot also carries a small maneuvering unit during EVA, the so-called space gun. Designed by NASA engineers of the Flight Crew Support Division, the gun provides a limited amount of thrust from compressed oxygen for basic maneuvering experiments. Gemini 4 is counting down on the launch pad. As the count goes into its final two hours, the crew arrives at pad 19. There have been no holds. The weather is good. 
the astronauts enter the elevator and ride it to the Erector White Room, which surrounds Gemini 4. The crew enters the spacecraft. The hatches are sealed, 7.32 Eastern Standard Time. The crew is now a part of the countdown. They begin checking out the spacecraft systems. It is T minus 100 minutes. The launch vehicle and spacecraft continue the clean count, interrupted only by a bulky erector which didn't want to lower properly. That cost us some time but presented no serious problem. At T minus 30 minutes, the pad was cleared. Now there is just a spacecraft, launch vehicle, and two men on top of it. All systems are good at this time. We launch control at the Cape. T minus 10 minutes and counting. Six minutes before launch. The spacecraft test conductor signed off to the spacecraft with these final words. Okay, Jim, have a good flight. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition and start. Lift off. At 10.16 Eastern Standard Time, Gemini 4 was on its way. We have a roll program initiated. Flight to launch have started. And in sync. And in sync. Roger. Roll Flight program completed. McDivitt report. And the pitch program has been initiated. Roger. Mark 50 seconds and we're go. Guidance reports to go. The flight trajectory looks very, very close to right on the nominal value. That's good. Flight data pretty noise, but we're okay. Flight photo, good on Mach 3, a little high. And Jimmy McDivitt reports Gemini 4 is go for staging, which will occur in a very few seconds. Just go. We have staging, and it's been confirmed here on the ground. Trust looks good. Gemini 4 entered orbit with an insertion velocity of 25,745 feet per second, within 11 feet per second of planned velocity. The apogee of the first orbit was 177.6 statute miles. The perigee, 100.8 statute miles. Command pilot McDivitt started to work at once, attempting to fly an airplane formation with the second stage of the launch vehicle. The full resources of NASA in Houston were on hand to support Gemini 4. From a new three-storied building, flight controllers at the Manned Spacecraft Center assumed direct control of the mission for the first time in the space program. The mission director now checked the status of a possible rendezvous. Ask him about his track with the launch vehicle. Roger. I have it decided this time it's directly below me, about uh, four or five feet up with a front dock. Everything seemed favorable at that time. But as the first orbit progressed, the second stage of the launch vehicle drew away. Roger, Brian. Uh, we still have the booster. We're out quite a ways from it now. Uh, it's taken a little more fuel than we had anticipated. To really make a major effort to close this last thing or to save the fuel? The answer was almost immediate from the mission director. You might tell him, uh, as far as we're concerned, we want to save the fuel. We're concerned about the light time more than we are matching that booster. Okay. And that was it. Okay. The second stage of the launch vehicle went on to become simply Space Object 1391. It would burn up over the Mid-Atlantic two days later. Yeah, my four. Okay, we're giving you a go for your EVA at this time. Okay. The crew started their checklist for EVA, but Command Pilot McDivitt decided not to rush things. He elected to go for EVA on the third revolution. Hawaii, Gemini 4. Go ahead, Gemini 4. Next pass around. I don't think we want to try. Very good. Tell Roger, I understand. Next that. pass around. Tell him we're happy with that. Most of the world waited 100 miles below. The crew had completed final preparations. The cabin was depressurized and the hatch open. Coming up on Hawaii, McDivitt reported that he was satisfied and ready to begin EVA. Serge, you ready to have him get out? Roger, flight, we're go. He's got some uh, nice elevated rates, which we expected, and uh, he's, he's really speeded it up, but he looks great. Let's go. Okay. Hawaii, Houston flight. Houston flight, Hawaii, Capcom, go. Tell him we're ready to have him get out when he is. Gemini 4, Hawaii, Capcom. We just had word from Houston. We're ready to have you get out whenever you're ready. Okay, we've got our go now, is that right? Affirmative. 
Okay, we're still doing a little work right here. Roger, I understand. Get his status, Hawaii. Gemini 4, Hawaii, Cap Drum. Okay, I'm separating from the spacecraft. Okay, separating from the spacecraft at this time, Hawaii. Okay, my feet are out. Okay, my feet are out. I think I'm dragging a little bit, so I don't want to fire the gun yet. Yeah, no, you don't. Okay, I'm out. Okay, he's out. He's close to free. Okay, I put a little roll in, took it right out. Am I in your view, Jimbo? Yeah, you know, I can't see it on the paper. Don't sweat it, I'll come over to you. Let's take your glove, I'll just let it go. All right. Okay, I rolled off, I'm rolling to the right now. It's under my own influence. There goes a... Looks like a thermal glove, Jim. It is, Ed. Alright. Now I've come above the spacecraft. I'm coming back down now. I'm under my own control. Okay, I'm coming over. You look beautiful. I feel like a million dollars. I'm coming back to you. The gun, the gun works real good, Jim. Let me get over here where I can see. Yeah. Well, I got, got me upside down. I, okay, don't fire the truck. Make that flag look pretty. Yep. Okay, I'm right by the I'm right by the stub antenna now. Okay. Let me let me get some moves for you, there. I already get some tremendous pictures of you. Let me try again with the hot one. Okay, I think I've exhausted my okay. air now. Stay right there. I had very good control with it. I just needed more air. Okay, stand by. Let me take a couple pictures, All right. Tell them what you think. That's right. Capcom, it's very easy to maneuver with the gun. The only problem I have is I haven't got enough fuel. I've exhausted the fuel now, but I was able to maneuver myself out front of the spacecraft back. I maneuvered right up back on the back of the adapter. Just above Jim, came back into his view. This is the greatest experience. I've, it's just tremendous. But right I, now, I'm standing on my head, and I'm looking right down. It looks like we're coming up on the coast of California. As I go on a slow rotation to the right. There is absolutely no disorientation associated with it. One thing about it, uh, when, when Ed gets out there and starts wiggling around, it sure makes the spacecraft tough to control. Okay, I'm drifting down underneath the spacecraft. There's no difficulty with uh, recontacting the spacecraft. It's all very soft. Particularly as long as you move nice and slow. I feel very thankful to have the experience to be doing this. I'll bring myself in and put myself out into your future. Is he taking pictures? Okay, do you want me to maneuver for you now, Ed? No, I think you're doing fine. What I'd like to do is get all the way out, Jim, and get a picture of the whole spacecraft. I don't seem to be doing that. Yet. Yeah, I noticed that. You can't seem to get far enough away. No. Texas, remote your air to ground. California, go local. I'm coming back down on the spacecraft. Listen, it's all a difference in the world with this gun. When that gun was working, I was maneuvering all around. Just for your information, Ed, we're only down to 48% on our O2. Okay. He's got uh, O2 pressure is about 830, so stay right up there. Let me get a picture of it. Can you see the camera here? Uh, yeah. No, not now. I'm out of it. Yeah, you got about five minutes. Okay, I'm going to let myself go out now. Jiminy 4, Houston. The thing about the reference you're talking about looks like it's here right. You don't even need one. 74, Houston, Capcom. Josh, this is Jim. Uh, what, got any for us? The flight director says get back in. Right. Okay. okay. One. Where are we over now, Jim? I don't know. I'm 
no, no, we're coming over to the west, west there, and they want you to come back in now. Back in? Back in. Roger, we've been trying to talk to you for a while here. Come on in. you got about four minutes to go from you to LOS. History will record that Command Pilot McDivitt opened the hatch at 2.42 Eastern Standard Time. And a little after 3 o'clock along the eastern seaboard, Pilot White had opened up a new frontier for Americans to explore. In 21 and one-half minutes, EVA was completed. Inside the spacecraft, the crew was faced with a problem. The hatch would not close. That day in St. Louis, when McDivitt took apart the locking mechanism, now paid off. The hatch finally closed. The cabin was repressurized, and the mission settled back into its four-day cycle. The crew was busy stowing the extra equipment. What do you think, huh? Yeah, he's busy, and he'd rather not talk to us. Right. America settled back into its daily routine. TV and radio returned to their regular programs. News reporters and editors concentrated on other stories. Like their earthbound counterparts, the crew settled down to working, eating, sleeping. But most of us have not flown in orbit. It might seem that two men in space for four days have considerable time hanging over them. What is it like? Your basic job is that of a space test pilot. And like all test pilots, you must follow a careful routine. Each spacecraft system must be checked out on a planned schedule. You verify your readings with ground control. It goes like this. an astronaut stuck very close to the basic job of flying a mission, performing as many simple experiments as his flight plan permitted. But the four days of Gemini 4 gave command pilot McDivitt an opportunity to live in space and plan work on a scale impossible before. His flight plan included 11 onboard experiments. For convenience, they may be roughly divided into medical, measurement, and photographic categories. There were three medical experiments, in-flight exercise, in-flight phonocardiogram, and bone demineralization. The five measurement experiments included measurement of radiation spacecraft exterior, radiation spacecraft interior, measurement of the electrostatic charge accumulated on the spacecraft exterior, measurement of the direction and amplitude of the Earth's magnetic field sextant-type measurements for navigation study. And finally, there were three photographic experiments, synoptic weather photography, synoptic terrain photography, earth limb photography. All 11 experiments are important in increasing our knowledge of how man will live and work in space, but the photographic experiments are visually more interesting to us. As Gemini 4 swept over Africa, it looked down on the ancient Nile Delta from approximately 120 miles in space. In a single photograph, it caught a view that includes portions of seven countries in which some 25 million people live. Experts identify Alexandria dead center screen at the bottom of the frame. This is Port Said, entrance to the Suez. Tel Aviv and the Dead Sea with their long historical associations are left screen and to the right, almost parallel, lie the Red Sea and the Gulf of Suez. The Earth's limb, or boundary layer of red and blue above the atmosphere, was the subject of another experiment. Reduced to a gray scale by filters, these photographs will be studied with a microdensitometer to determine the excess elevation of the blue limb above the red as an aid in space navigation. The experiments were conducted throughout the entire mission, and all were completed. On the second day, as Gemini 4 came within range of Hawaii, it set a new American space record. Everyone was pretty casual. Well, I also would like to congratulate the new American space flight record. Congratulations. All right, here we got uh, quite a few more to go. People went to work and returned home. In many parts of the country, it was already summer. With the weekend coming up, the cars were heading for the beach. The mission of Gemini to live and work in space for four days went on. Food has been planned as a working man's ration. Four meals a day, 2,600 calories. 
Laid out on a table, it looks a little different from a regular meal. Plastic packages with bite-sized meals or freeze-dried food to be reconstituted with water. But it was good, solid, everyday fare. Meat, salmon, chocolate pudding, chicken, potato soup. After the first day, the astronauts ate the prescribed four meals a day. They would come down with only a portion of the last meal left. But sleep in space required an initial adjustment by the crew. It was somewhat like sleeping out under field conditions. Each astronaut showed individual patterns of response to the new environment, and White seemed to sleep more restfully than McDivitt. During the final two days of the mission, Command Pilot McDivitt took a series of formal and informal motion picture shots with a 16-millimeter camera mounted at the pilot's window. The camera turns inward. For a brief moment, we are able to ride tourist class with Gemini 4, watching the crew at work. We catch a glimpse of a space sunrise, flaring in brilliant color over the Earth's horizon. Using the same camera, McNivet photographed ground objects, including this small island in the Gulf of Mexico off the Texas coast. On another occasion, he photographed approaches to Yuma, Arizona. The detail seen here shows great promise for scientific exploration of the Earth, heretofore impossible. Using this technique, we could chart the major currents of the ocean, study weather patterns, and map the geology of the Earth. Shortly after the new shift came into mission control on the fourth day, the first spacecraft problem arose. The computer did not function. The malfunction was pinpointed in the 49th revolution. When it did not clear up, mission director Christopher Kraft made a decision. Gemini 4 would go to a rolling re-entry. He immediately queried the command pilot. Hey, Gemini 4, what is your feelings on a rolling re-entry versus a 90 degree bank angle? We're recommending rolling here. Yeah, get the job done, so why don't we go ahead with it? The 60th revolution, the fourth day, and the computer out, but no problem. The flight surgeons made their final checks. Both men were busy stowing equipment. Now it was the 62nd revolution, coming up on Hawaii. The orbital attitude and maneuver thrusters were fired to assure orbital decay and re-entry if the retrograde rockets did not fire. Now television and radio were back again. A nation paused on a Monday morning, waiting to fly in with the crew of Gemini 4. Give him an eight-minute mark to uh, retro fire. Gemini 4, Hawaii, stand by for an eight-minute mark to retro five. Two, one, mark. Mark. Gemini 4 would fly the same type of re-entry as Gemini 2, an earlier unmanned flight. We will illustrate the re-entry of McDivitt with film from that flight. This is an onboard camera, Gemini 2, looking through the spacecraft window. The film is reproduced at four times normal speed. You're doing great. How about you? Gemini 4, Houston, Capcom. Oh, Houston, Gemini 4. Roger, you start your rolling rantry. Roger. Roger. Uh, your weather is still very good, Jim. Communications with the ground break off, but the onboard tape recorder is running. We listen to two men returning to Earth after four days in space. Look at us. We're making some fire, too. Yeah. They're making a putting our ionization layer out. They're not reading the same point now, probably. There goes Florida. Is that Florida? I believe this. See it on your side? Yeah. They're red hot. Yeah. Sit back and relax. We ain't going to do much about it from here out. No. Get ready for the cheek. During re-entry, the USS WASP launched 13 search and recovery aircraft. 
Gemini 4 splashed down at 12.13 Eastern Standard Time, June 7, 1965. It was sighted by a search aircraft seven minutes later. Navy frogmen swiftly attached the flotation collar, and at 12.39, Command Pilot McDivitt opened the hatch. Both men took a deep gulp of fresh air. Four days in space had ended. The command pilot requested a pickup by helicopter, and in a matter of minutes, the prime recovery helicopter had the crew safely on board. They were flown to the deck of the WASP. Admiral William McCormick, commander of the Western Atlantic Recovery Forces and his staff, offered the first formal congratulations on the flight. The crew then walked to the carrier elevator, bound for their physical examination. A long series of physical examinations would follow in the days ahead. The condition of both astronauts was excellent. While the doctors were examining the crew, another group of men were scrutinizing other data just as closely. The engineers who designed the spacecraft and solved the problems took a hard look at what happened. They analyzed miles of coded tape which spell out each detail of the mission. The results were more than a demonstration of man's ability to go into space and return. Gemini 4 was a major advance in manned space flight operations, the first time two men had spent four days in space. The crew, eating, working, sleeping in space, demonstrated that man can perform a number of functions in the exploration of space in a properly controlled environment and suffer no significant ill effect from extended space flight. Colonel White demonstrated that an extravehicular astronaut could travel in a precise manner from point to point. For the first time during an extravehicular activity, the spacecraft was flown with steady control by its command pilot. Colonel McDivitt also performed re-entry under manual control, further evidence that man can circumvent problems which arise by carrying out a primary operation in a straightforward manner. Gemini 4 was an encouraging landmark in relation to the future objectives of both the Gemini and Apollo programs.